Welcome everyone to Deeper Insights Tech Canada's webinar series. My name is Ruth Ann and I'll be the moderator for today um, and every day actually. So welcome to everyone joining us. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the lineup that we have. We are on Thursdays going through the summer and into the fall. So next week we are going to be going into your financial picture and helping provide clarity and a really good opportunity to, to see how you can shore up your business. I mean, without good finances, you, you, don't, you can't do very well. So please join us with uh, Spencer Shannon, who is a CPA and a professor of accounting at the University of British Columbia. He probably does the, the most um, simplified version, yet so deep and condensed. Uh, of how to open up your uh, finances for better clarity. And then following that, we have Mark Parrott from the United States going to be talking to us on meta trends. Mark is one of Vistage uh, US's top speakers. And then on August the 13th, we have Dave Copps. So he is going to be going into the world of AI, machine learning, and what the future of business might look like and is looking like worldwide as far as AI and learning. Today, our guest is Neil Smith. Uh, Neil Smith is someone who believes that human capital is the key to success in, Indian, in any enterprise. And after more than a decade of working in senior roles and advisory position, positions for several Fortune 100 companies, Neil has branched off and he started his own consultancy house called Agriculture Advisory Group. Neil, I'm going to let you go into a little bit more of your background and why you're with us today as you go through this talk. So I'm just going to turn it over to you. Welcome, Neil. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone that's joined uh, from across Canada here. It's a privilege to be here and uh, uh, to be uh, inserted between such a great lineup of uh, speakers. Uh, I'm excited to, to share with you some of what really fuels me and drives me. Um, as Ruth Ann mentioned, I I've worked with several uh, Fortune 100 companies uh, in different industries uh, right the way through North America. I have a background in organizational management uh, and uh, a passion for people, which is where I got my uh, undergrad in psychology and I uh, continue to bridge the two together. The reason I started Agriculture Advisory Group is I feel that there is a groundswell happening in agriculture and it is missing some of the uh, key foundations uh, from the business and human side interconnecting the upstream to the downstream, so the growers to the consumer. Uh, and I have an aim to try to uh, bridge the gap between these two, uh, these two worlds. Uh, a lot of other market spaces have uh, terrific management consultants, uh, advisors, uh, and knowledge leaders uh, that help support and grow those market spaces. Agriculture uh, now more than ever is uh, you know, very visible and present uh, uh, in our world, and we're we're thinking more about it. Uh, not only the food that we're eating, where it comes from, uh, and then how it's growing. And I really think there is a paradigm shift that is happening. I know it was a paradigm shift for me uh, to why I started my business, uh, and a little bit about why I'm presenting this talk today. So I originally hail from uh, the mountains of uh, British Columbia. I've uh, been out in the prairies, the Paris of the prairies, uh, in Saskatoon for the last 15 years. Uh, embedded in the breadbasket of Canada, which is agriculture, and I eat, live, and breathe everything agriculture. I think it's just a, it's a wonderful world that uh, more people need to get to uh, be familiar with, uh, and uh, and really support. So today, the the essence of my talk is you know really understanding how to launch that idea and create a movement within agriculture. We need to change the world. We need to change the way we think about how we access food, uh, what food means in terms of nutrient dense food, uh, healthy, uh, consumable food, uh, the, the sort of the large conglomerates uh, in terms of transportation, that supply chain, uh, we, we certainly need to change the way we uh, are accessing and, and moving our, um, our food. And uh, more so, we need to focus on how we can better support the grower or the producer and farmer. Uh, so you hear me talk about grower quite often. I just refer to the farmer and, and all the different crops. I refer to this model as what the duck and it really is a it's a symbiosis between mimicking nature and so i look at ducks as a key source uh telltale uh of how we can lead uh be leaders without titles uh and impact change and 
And by that, I mean being very flexible to adapt to whatever the environment throws at us. So what the duck is the movement I would uh, like to um, posit to you today as we uh, go through this presentation. So I'll give you a, a little bit of a background uh, on where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm going to get into the What the Duck leadership movement and, uh, and then discuss the movement movement itself. Uh, and then we'll close up with uh, a little bit of a summary. So my paradigm shift, I, I've worked in big ag for quite a while. Uh, I've worked with uh, um, chemical manufacturers, uh, fertilizer companies. Uh, I've worked with uh, agrologists and agronomists, uh, the downstream to innovative food producers, uh, the supply chain in terms of the grain handling uh, and, and um, uh, all the logistics that go uh, around with that. One of the biggest things that I got dismayed with is that we are actually growing food that isn't healthy, that we are putting a ton of product into the soils, depleting our soils of what nature is providing to us. Um, and it, it really was an, an all about me and, and still is by, by and large an all about me uh, agriculture world. And uh, I often say that the, the larger companies within agriculture are definitely focused on that radio station W2FM. What's in it for me? Uh, we need to change that. that. That paradigm shift for me is that I think I can affect change. Uh, and I really want to uh, talk about how we can do that. So for me, the, the love of neuroscience, uh, using what we have um, uh, in our own uh, cognitive abilities to see things differently, pick up the corner of the rug, talk about how we can leverage some of those uh, neurochemicals to innovate, uh, communicate differently, and, and better understand the world around us. My passion for agriculture ties right into this. Of course, uh, um, when you may or may not know at the moment, for some of you that are on the line that I do know, uh, is that I actually suffer from uh, a few different uh, food uh, ailments. And uh, so I get affected by wheat and gluten, um, more so wheat than anything. Uh, and so where everything is gluten-free in the stores, um, that's not so much of a concern. If it has a wheat base, I actually uh, am affected quite uh, readily by that. Uh, what I've discovered through some of my research and talking to scientists and working with labs and growers is that it's the way that the wheat is growing and it's actually what's in the soils that's affecting me. Um, and so it's the chemicals that we're putting on there, the foliars, the nutrients, uh, the fertilizers. And, uh, and that really got me thinking that, uh, you know, we need to do something different. I love people. So understanding the story of why growers are still growing the crops that they do, uh, why big egg is, is out there and there is a place for it. I'm, I'm not trying to knock them off of the knees. Um, you know, the, this movement isn't going to be overnight. Uh, it's going to be a collective working together and we need to bridge the gap between, uh, between the two. Um, and so where I come in is, is trying to better understand how we can facilitate those conversations between big egg and, and some of the movements that are happening out there. And one of those movements is called regenerative agriculture. Uh, if you walk away from today's presentation and uh, the next thing you do is jump on uh, any of the streaming channels, but Netflix in particular, there's a, a movie on, on there called um, My Big Little Farm. Uh, and it's about uh, uh, a couple. They were city slickers in California and they moved out to the farm and they uh, created this wonderful regenerative farm. And what I mean by regenerative is that they're not putting inputs into the ground. Uh, they're growing fabulous crops. They're young. Um, they're putting cattle and livestock on there. Uh, and one of their key linchpins is the duck. The duck is uh, giving them all the telltale of what they need to do in terms of, um, you know, putting more fish uh, diversity into the ponds. The water that they use to irrigate the fields has got the right uh, nutrients in it, the right chemistries in it. Um, they eat the slugs, which allow the trees to blossom better. Um, they are an amazing group, uh, a flock of, of um, birds that, uh, you know, scare off uh, some of the uh, um, invading species uh, and, and other animals like coyotes. Uh, so I highly recommend watching that movie because it, it will give you an insight to where I'm just scratching the surface in this presentation. Um, and it will really allow you to uh, um, better comprehend um, some of my passion that fuels me. But at the end of the day, what I wanted to do is stop having these circular conversations about needing to change. Um, and, and stop fence jumping the issues that are actually visible in front of us. Uh, and I think uh, over the last four months, more and more of us have been um, 
aware of some of the constraints that are happening in, in our food supply. And, uh, you know, I'm a little bit nervous about this fall. I think there's going to be a large shortage in beef and, and pork uh, on our own grocery markets. Uh, we're seeing grocery chains being taxed. Uh, and, you know, so that's a, a constraint point for us. Um, we need to talk about these issues and find solutions to them. We need leaders to be organized and persistent in how they approach these conversations. Uh, so we're not looking like we're trying to take away or it's not all about me. Uh, it is a collective effort. And that's really what I want to uh, dive into. So we haven't been good to our earth. Uh, our soils are being de deplenished of, uh, of all the, you know, um, the nutrients that they need. Uh, I was just, uh, you, you may or may be, uh, may or may not be able to see that I'm a little bit sunburnt. I was in southern Manitoba for the last few days, uh, walking the fields with some regenerative farmers down there. And it's amazing to see the sorghum, the wheat, the, the crops that are growing, uh, the biodiversity that's down there. Uh, and they haven't put any, anything into the, uh, the soils. And the model of regenerative ag uh, and where we need to steer away from uh, the, the negative effects that we have on our soils, the model is one plus one equals three. We do something good by putting a cover crop on the field so we never have exposed earth. Um, we, we have a crop blends that work together so uh, that, that diversity is, is working together. We're uh, sequestering some of the carbon release and, and managing the nitrogen, uh, so it's all science-based. Uh, but below the surface is really where all the, the key elements are happening. Um, and because of all the uh, the the growth roots uh, of all the different species and plants from the cover crops, when we actually sow in the crop that we want to grow, we'll call it rye or malt barley or canola, um, we're going to get greater density in terms of the grains that are coming out of there, which is really what we want, nutrient-dense product. Uh, and we want, uh, we want to see some of that growth. And so it's not about getting bushels per acre. It's about getting nutrient-dense product. The other thing that we need to think about is the more we have – biodiversity below the soil because we're creating some uh, of that effect above uh, we're also opening up an opportunity to stimulate some of the livestock and the animals that are out there and so putting pigs onto your soil is a great thing um, having cows that are um, you know eating your cover crops before you sow in uh, adding ducks to the mix you know this is what we need we need to see the symbiosis uh, of nature come together and we are just the facilitators so it's instead of all about uh, us and trying to get the biggest bushel, we need to shrink the scale of our farms and put more biodiversity in there from the animal kingdom uh, as well as the plant kingdom uh, and work that together. Lately, it feels like we've been sent home. At least I feel that way. I've been at home for quite a few months other than a couple of uh, small trips here and there. Uh, thinking about you know what we've done in agriculture, it, it is an industry I'm very proud to be part of. Uh, but sitting in my home office uh, here in, in Saskatoon, every day I'm reading and, and, and learning about the, the, the detriment that we have uh, created within our agriculture um, sector. And it's uh, everything from upstream all the way down to downstream, from the grower, uh, even the science but before the grower in terms of the seed and the, and the chemistry, all the way down to consumer. And so we need, we need innovative leaders. We need leaders uh, to lead without titles. Um, we need to be asking, what the duck? Well, how can we improve this? We need to be, you know, fueled by some of this uh, uh, craziness that's going on within agriculture. And, and that's the best way to put it. Um, I really, truly believe that when we emerge from uh, the pandemic, I mean, I believe we're living in a, the new era already. It's not when we start living in uh, post-COVID. We are living it. Uh, but when we emerge, millions are going to demand change and that's because of some of the things that are yet to come and i'm not trying to instill just fear uh, i'm trying to evoke emotion because it's the emotion that's going to drive the leadership it's going to drive the change in the conversations that we need to see happen um, and that change is going to come from a global level uh, and again it's about not larger and bigger is better uh, and it's not about the dollars it's about doing something that's going to help your fellow humans uh, and in your own local communities first and that's where i want to start uh, Southern Manitoba, uh, I believe, is one of the uh, epicenters in Canada for the regenerative movement. They are certainly taking uh, a lot of pride and making the strides and having the conversations, those awkward conversations, doing things differently. Uh, and they are being condemned a little bit. Uh, you know, fingers are being pointed at them for 
you know, not buying the volume of chemistry that we need, that they're, uh, you know, potentially creating more carbon in the atmosphere than we want. Uh, um, they're not managing the nitrogen levels uh, for the release of uh, plants and in the soils. Uh, they're creating an infestation of bugs that's, you know, not going to be controlled. Uh, but what they're proving, and, and this has been going on for quite a few years, what they're proving is that that is actually not the case, that there is actually a benefit to think about uh, changing the way we farm, getting away from monocrops to multi-diversifiable crops, from large scale to small scale, taking that farmer to consumer, removing some of the constraints of grocery. Now, there is a spot for it. But we don't always have to go through the wholesale or the retail channels. We can go direct to consumer right from the farm uh, and get, uh, you know, a healthier product, whether it's your meat, whether it's your grain, whether it's your jams uh, and your berries. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. It, it can be healthier, but we have to start that right at ground level. And so this groundswell that's happening is, is really where I'm driving uh, how I can affect the conversations. So I agriculture advisory group. Um, Work very closely on, on that neuroscience part uh, with a group uh, out of uh, um, BC and, and also sort of a, a knock on effect all the way up to uh, Denmark, which is Lego. And so Lego put out a, a neuroscience learning platform called Serious Play. Um, and that's where that little duck comes from. And, and the essence of it is to learn how to communicate differently through different mediums, um, understanding the different uh, personalities that are embedded within our cultures and our communities and there is no one right way to build a duck you can take these same six lego pieces that uh, you see on the screen here and you can create um, I believe there's uh, 800,000 different variations of the duck that can be built um, through these six little lego bricks uh, and really what that tells us is that our brain has a capacity to do things very differently using what's right in front of us. And that's what I love about that. And I just translate that into leadership. I translate that into innovative leaders that don't need to have a title, that aren't doing it for the, the dollars. They're not doing it for the uh, remuneration or the notoriety. They're doing it to affect change because they care about their brothers and sisters and mothers and family and friends, their local communities, uh, and how we continue to survive. And so I'm, I'm privileged to work with uh, uh, strategic play uh, out of uh, British Columbia that uh, really promotes uh, this learning model. Uh, I embed it in just about everything I do, and uh, and it's why I talk about what the duck. Um, we need to move into this this direction. Just to give you some context, ducks have been around for eons, uh, and they were actually revered back all the way back in the Roman days. They they saved the Romans, who uh, you know, depending on what side of uh, history or antiquity you want to think about, um, you know, have created the world that uh, we understand. Uh, they saved them from the, the Gauls. But what they do is, is they work together. It's a collective group that uh, um, sounds the alarm. And you can see that. You can see that in nature. Ducks will fly away from wetlands that are unhealthy. Um, they will end up in areas that are healthy. They'll eat the, the organisms and leave organisms. Um, and if you see uh, ducks plumage uh, all over the place, it means we're doing something wrong with our soils. They give us so much feedback. Uh, the other neat thing about them is that they model what I consider to be one of the foundations of leadership, which is supporting each other, uh, allowing others to lead uh, when you can't carry that burden. And they really uh, model that in, in nature. And, and so I just want to take that. Um, I call, I talk about biodiversity on a regular basis. Uh, I want to mimic nature in terms of our human interactions. I want to mimic what the ducks are doing, uh, in, in our, uh, everyday, um, human interactions, whether out in the field or in the grocery store, um, or out on the street. You know, we need to work together and, and really care and support for each other. Uh, it's hard. Uh, you know what? Ruth Ann and I were just having a quick conversation prior to this, uh, presentation and, We've created this world of anxiety, um, and, and not through our doing, you know, the unfortunate uh, pandemic that's taken place, but we look at people as potential infections. We, we don't see them as, from an empathetic standpoint. Um, you know, we, we even cross the street if somebody's coughing, uh, you know, in, in the recent last couple of weeks. Um, it is a, I was at the gas station yesterday filling up and it's the same thing, you know, it's, uh, a little bit cautiously, uh, you know, pessimistic about uh, the potential of interaction. And I get that from helping reduce what's happening, 
but from that human aspect of trying to influence change, to be model leaders, uh, innovative leaders, uh, we need to look at each other as humans and we need to support each other. So that leadership shift is, is going to help ensure change happens. The what the duck model is something that uh, is going to allow us to move into what I call the food hub. And this, this screen here, I realize it's just a little bit blurry, so hopefully you can read it okay. But the food hub is that economic model that aggregates and distributes locally produced foods. That's where it starts. It's not the food coming from the States or from China or from Europe uh, or from Australia. It's locally grown. Uh, you know, here in, in Saskatoon, I want to know what's locally grown. I want to support my local growers first and foremost. I get up uh, on Saturdays and I love going to the farmer's market during the summer, but that's the only time in Saskatoon we have the farmer's market. Uh, and we need to see this happen on a more regular basis on a year round cycle. Um, and without sounding too ethereal and without sounding too uh, uh, hippie, but at, and, and there's a great model for that, the food hub is where we start to influence change because it's the consumer that is asking the question, where is this food growing? How do we know what was put into it? How, what's the nutrient density? What's that value price point of it? How do we ensure that others uh, that may live in different economic means can access this and stay healthy? Um, knowing where your food comes from also gives you an understanding of what's below the soil, how it was growing, uh, meaning it will create more sustainable um, ground and, and, and have longevity in our fields and, and the earth that we live on. So a lot of what I do is work with innovative companies nowadays. As I mentioned, I've, I've worked with a lot of the big players. I've worked with a lot of the uh, innovative companies, um, you know, a lot of companies in, in the States that are trying to uh, shake things up. Uh, I've also worked with uh, the science labs that are creating microbes and uh, micronutrients to you know, put into the soils. And I keep coming back that we need to stop putting more on uh, and we need to think about how we can use nature to do what nature should be doing so they can feed us and, uh, and allow us to think a little bit differently. I'm very privileged for the companies that I work with. You know, I, I, I feel chuffed that they've allowed me to share some of my insights and, and align and build these strategies and allow them to think differently. Uh, the, the model of leadership that we, we talk about, what the duck, uh, I take in and, and, and try to flatten the curve on some of the hierarchical components of, of businesses uh, and really try to self-empower and, and identify, uh, you know, those individuals that are okay with trying things and, and not feeling right, are okay asking the silly questions. Uh, and I take this directly from, uh, from a few different uh, speakers, but uh, uh, you have to ask the silly questions to realize brilliance. It's the silly questions that we, we don't ask, you know, uh, you know that, that cliche saying there's no dumb questions. Well, it's those silly questions, those questions that we feel like, oh, I shouldn't ask that because I should know that. Um, simple questions, you know, they don't have to be overthought about. They're not coming from an academic standpoint. We need to ask these silly questions to realize brilliance. And just before I carry on, um, I thought maybe I'd just take a moment. I've been rambling, uh, allowing my coffee to kick in, sharing a little bit about my story. Uh, do we have any questions uh, that anyone would like to ask that I could help answer or, or flush out a little bit? I would encourage everyone to just uh, type in any questions or comments into the question box. One of the things that I've noticed, Neil, and you talked about this, was the farm to consumer um, trend is really coming forward. And I've even seen it on social media with Facebook, you know, for, um, you know, uh, beef producers, uh, meat producers, et cetera, to, to sell directly to consumers. I'm seeing more advertising like that. Are you seeing that kind of trend in social media as well? Absolutely. It's, it's one of the, the fun things that's happening within the regenerative sector in particular is it's trying to find more uh, connective ways to go from grower to consumer. Um, and that direct to consumer model is, it's, it's needed. We need to inject that into the models that we currently have, retail, wholesale. Um, there is a play for all of it, but this direct-to-consumer is, is vitally important to ensure our local communities and then the larger communities around us continue to thrive. And so we need to support that from the marketing end. You know, that there's very innovative uh, marketing companies um, that are, are, are 
primed to help this direct to consumer model. I mean, we have the technology and platforms. If the last four or five months have taught us anything is that people have an ability to get online and start uh, digesting uh, an ability to access produce and food. Um, I know locally, uh, I, I lean on my local Save On Foods to deliver food to me. Uh, and I would love to just be able to call up the local growers at the farmer's market and have them do food box delivery. We're seeing uh, a company in, in Manitoba called sustainablegrains.ca. Uh, they're creating, uh, working with local uh, beef uh, producers and growers, uh, cattle producers in, in Manitoba, um, and they're getting the beef butchered and going through the, the proper facilities uh, and then packaging that in boxes and delivering it right to the consumer. Uh, and this is uh, naturally fed, uh, organically fed uh, uh, cattle that are grazing on cover crops and, and the biodiversity. Uh, and so they're taking this, this concept from upstream and they're taking it right to the consumer. The hurdle is, is payment. How do we, you know, do the exchange in, in terms of the finances? Um, the, some of the logistics that happen in terms of the regulations, uh, within the different provinces. And, uh, we need to think about how we can help alleviate some of these pain points. So those, uh, that direct consumer model is, uh, is going to be recognized. And you're right. It's such a new model and it, it really goes against how things have been do done for hundreds of years here. So it is, but it, as you say, uh, COVID really opened the door for, you know, that direct to consumer, um, opportunities with, with different boxes and so forth. So that's fantastic. Anyway, we're going to carry on. And uh, if there are questions, I'll, I'll let you. Terrific. I appreciate that. So what the duck, the, the, the actual leadership componentry um, hinges on uh, some of those aspects that I talked about that the ducks portray to us that we watch nature uh, in its finest. And uh, that flexibility, um, the physical and, and mentality components of ducks uh, working together to solve problems easily. You know, they don't overthink things. They're okay to make mistakes and tweak along the way. Um, now, as humans, some of that hinges on our behavioral makeup. You know, some of us are more prone uh, to be able to move in that model, and some of us uh, feel a little bit awkward, and, and it raises anxiety. Uh, but it's the ability to recognize and communicate some of those just behavioral components so we can uh, more effortlessly um, impact uh, the the, the leadership spectrum and, and what we're trying to actually affect. But the biggest thing is the flexibility. Our environments uh, change, you know, and farmers are, are, are definitely, uh, you know, a, a key uh, leader in this. They, they continuously talk about the uh, weather um, and how that's impacting them. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, we try to control. We kind of, we try to control uh, what's happening externally to how we need to roll out our processes, our, our tasks. Um, we're not as flexible. Leaders don't have this, this ingrained, flexible, um, uh, key, uh, critical uh, component uh, embedded in them. And we need to really start teaching that. And that comes right out of watching the ducks. Um, flexibility to adapt with the, the change in the environment to the change that's happening in our economic streams, to the change in technology. Uh, not fear it, but adapt to it. Uh, and this goes all the way to our communication, um, you know, that, that limbic brain that uh, some other speakers talk of quite often in, in terms of some of that neuroscience. It's that ability to adapt quickly and, and not overthink it. Um, and it does take some practice. And we need to teach that uh, to our younger generations and even those that are in leadership positions right now. Um, we need to break down some of that bureaucracy that happens when we are thinking about adapting in the red tape. Um, you know, we see this right at the grower level as well. You know, when in, when the weather changes, they try to control the environment. And what happens is they often put more of the things we don't want to put into our soil onto the plants to control the bugs and control the microorganisms and control what's happening in the soils. Uh, and sure, it has a short-term effect, but that long-term effect is uh, negatively impacted. And so that's what I really want to have that conversation is, uh, you know, Infect the what the duck leadership model and learn to be more flexible and, and adaptive with how we communicate and how we model what others uh, need to be doing and how we support others in uh, understanding that flexibility. So this potential, uh, I believe, uh, what the duck has a, an opportunity to reach audiences everywhere. If we can take what Lego has done in creating a, a methodology and a tool and what some innovative companies are doing to help 
bring this to the market spaces and it doesn't that's not just agriculture but uh, companies uh, in every market space um and and advisory groups like myself and, and many others that are out there if we can t start talking about this more readily and and offer presentations um start affecting uh, the, the thought process a little bit for us to think differently we can actually start seeing a difference at the grower level and get to that regenerative and sustainable farming practice that we need to be at and and this is going to be critical as we move forward in the next uh, few years um and it's not about feeding the 90 billion by 2050 uh that you know that's a that's a BHAG that's out there and that's great we need to recognize that but we need to talk about the local change that uh that it needs to happen and that's that regenerative sustainable farming so the ideas around this and i apologize for the background noise my um home office here it's uh, the world we live in a little bit uh, um, has cleaners that keep us safe so uh, um, I didn't think they were coming until tomorrow but if there's some background noise uh, that's what it is the behaviors that we need to change they are those uh, shifts that we need to see in that that paradigm shift so we go from our animal behavior which is on the in the black zone there we get into this depth uh, democratic model of uh, you know, weighing out the, the pros and, and cons, the go, no go, uh, capabilities, the consensus or the, you know, the cohesiveness around the consensus to move things more forward. And I want to stop there. I mean, they're black and red because I don't think they're serving our purpose well as it comes to agriculture and as it comes to affecting change. I really want us to focus on that yellow zone, start thinking about that duck modeling that we need to show, uh, those that we work with and those that we support and those that we're working for. We need to think locally, which is homesteading, uh, our local communities, our local farmers markets, our local growers, uh, before we start thinking globally. And unfortunately, I, I, too many people and too many companies start to think globally before they've even understood their local uh, componentry. And then we really need to model leadership differently. It's not about the recognition. It's not about the clout. It's not about even having a title. It's about being able to empower and support those that are doing terrific work and communicate that to others so others can learn from the experiences uh, that are happening and apply the uh, those uh, those learnings that edification that happens uh, as we continue to shift towards regenerative farming core values are going to be key here and we need to amplify them empathy trust uh, um, being ethical in terms of uh, what we're trying to obtain and being trustworthy and, and I know, I know these are standard core values for a lot of people and, and we certainly feel that we should embody them and others should embody them too, but they're missing as we think about regenerative ag. When we think about the sustainable farming practices, um, people are being misled. There are, you know, there are chemical companies out there that are purposefully saying whatever they need to say so they can sell product. And it's not good product. It's, uh, you know, bugs in a jug is a, is a term that happens in agriculture. Um, it's having adverse effects both on our crops and on our animals, our livestock. Uh, and that only affects the downstream consumer. And, and health problems are on the rise uh, because of what's happening with these unethical, untrustworthy uh, companies that are out there toting the raw information, just saying what they need to to make a sale. And we need to change that. We need to uh, also start focusing on the ability to communicate openly, talk about the things uh, that are actually an issue, uh, stop fence jumping, uh, which is one of the core values that drives me. Um, and that's engaging at government levels, at, at municipal levels, at rural municipality levels, uh, at city uh, level, uh, and, and then those um, prominent larger enterprises that are, uh, you know, very much a, a plug into a lot of our urban cities. Um, and just as a, a point of reference, the largest uh, feedlot in the world are our urban centers. It's not the cows or the pigs or the, or the ducks uh, um, uh, or even the uh, poultry that's out there. The largest feedlots in the world are our human urban centers. We produce more carbon. We produce all the wrong things going up. We're gluttons of over excess. Uh, and that's just because of that, um, that you know, that, too, too large a scale or supply chains that are just pumping the wrong things at us and uh, we need to change that. We need to get smaller scale. I love what's happening uh, in urban centers and, and this is a bridge to 
regenerative agriculture. And it's called vertical farming. It's taking old buildings and starting to produce local microgreens and tomatoes um, in a vertical model uh, on rooftops. Uh, again, supplying their local communities, uh, making sure that it's nutrient-dense product. Now, the, the issue there is that how do we propagate seed to germinate? Again, some of the science, where does, where does uh, you know, the soil testing come in uh, within those models? Um, and so we need to demonstrate that on our sort of our, what I call conventional farming practices, uh, very present in the, in the prairies of Canada, uh, and then translate that into some of our urban center farming practices. Simple flock. I, I highly recommend you, you know, researching ducks and, and how they work together and, uh, and, and even, you know, watch ducks in, in nature. Go out to the ponds, into the wetlands, uh, find, uh, you know, a group of ducks. They mate as, as a pair, just like uh, many other bird species do. Geese mate for life, ducks mate for life, but they, they're always in a flock and they always work together. Um, and this last part of this saying here, each bird ensures the well-being and safety of the other one around them or the one next to them. This is really what I'm saying, and this is what I want to model. And it, it is supporting the farmers, and the farmers, you know, have done this for a while, but, you know, they've stopped sharing their farming practices because it's all about the bushels per acre, the dollars we're going to get. Um, they want to grow one crop, and they want to do it easy, and then they want to go to Florida, uh, you know, for the summers. Uh, and, pre-COVID, of course, uh, we, that's not a model that's sustainable. That, that is simply not going to continue to be something that's effective. And that's where I, I really want to change that narrative and change that story. For me, it's working with marketing firms. It's working with people from outside of agriculture and bringing them in and exposing their, uh, their opportunity because I care about them, just like the flocks of birds care about the person beside them. Um, you know, uh, those that work in different market spaces are the people beside me that I care about. That empathetic component, that core value that, uh, you know, greater together is how we're going to continue to survive. So again, that upstream to downstream, uh, very, very important. Regenerative and sustainable uh, farming. Uh, I highly recommend you think about regenerative ag and you think about the leaders that are in farming right now and how we can get them to think differently. Um, we can grow food without putting any inputs into it by using what nature provides. We can actually sequester the carbon. We can manage the nitrogen that's eroding our ozone uh, and, and, and the, the footprint. Uh, we don't need, you know, we've been infected that we need the chemicals. We need the foliars and the nutrients and the herbicides to manage weeds. Weeds aren't a bad thing. Uh, you know, I was, I was in a, uh, an oat crop yesterday and it was full of thistle. But that thistle is actually putting good nutrients, bio uh, diversity into the ground to allow that oat crop to grow strong and have nutrient dense uh, uh, grain that comes out of it. And so we have to think different. We have to pick up the corner of the carpet and it's going to take innovative leaders that model this, this duck model um, for us to get there. Uh, so regenerative egg, I, I always put regenerative and sustainable because you can have farming practices and methodologies and we've seen this since the 50s that potentially are good for a short period of time but it has to follow with sustainability we saw that in the 50s when they introduced fertilizer uh you know it it, it just continues to uh, erode what we're actually trying to get to which is that regenerative state but in the 50s it was great it's a short-term fix to grow crop and fertile we feed the crops yeah but we didn't realize what it was doing to the soils which was depleting and creating a lot of erosion um, and it's, uh, you know, we lose more land yearly uh, and take away the opportunities to continue to feed our local communities and then the larger communities around us. And then eventually, you know, the global market. I, I talk about this often. Uh, don't put more on, more on. Uh, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to be rude. Uh, but we really need to get away from putting more into the soils. We need to lead by demonstration through science. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, checking out Intercrop Alliance. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, agriculture labs that do soil testing. There's a group out of uh, again Manitoba um, uh, Crop Care that uh, you know provides science vetting behind it. You can follow Joe Williams. You can follow Graham Sait. Uh, these are all prominent thought leaders within the regenerative movement, uh, and it really is about understanding the science. And we can vet and we can prove and we can model what we need to do for our soils. And, 
you know, all the different elements that go in there from the macro nutrients to the micronutrients, boron and zinc. Uh, how do we deal with urea? And by the way, on top of every crop, there's a cloud of urea and other components. And how do we use that, you know, to benefit the crop? So it's not about putting more on. Um, and it, every time we think about that or every time we hear that, it should, it should make us shudder. And we should actually ask the question, why do we need to put more on? Um, what's the purpose? Because we can't actually just put a different variety of, of crop in there. Maybe we put uh, cows, maybe we put pigs in there and it's going to stimulate the soils to produce the same result. Nutrient dense food that is healthy for the consumer. So the what the duck leadership model from a foundational learning component uh, follows these elements here. So it's a great way to introduce the power of diversity in our thinking. Um, Using creative play, you know, if I take the actual Lego model that was built, the methodology, uh, there's there's a process and steps we can, and I do this with growers, I do this with uh, traditionalists, uh, all the way up to the newest generation entering the egg sector. Um, everyone has a f affinity to Lego of some sort. Uh, that, that plug and play, tangible uh, component is affecting our neural pathways. We're able to tell stories and share and, and understand by being creative, by using the power of blocks. Uh, to think differently. And so that diversity through such a simple tool allows us to communicate differently, which is allows us to think differently. We've opened up pathways and the aha moment of uh, um, uh, ballrooms in our brain to absorb information and digest it. And so we can have an open heart and an open mind. Uh, you can incorporate uh, the micro bits of uh, playful learning uh, to make your content stick. And so it's great to learn, but we all probably have been to Sessions like this where we hear it, yeah, it's great, and we leave uh, and we don't retain. And so we need that tangibility. We need those neural connections to retain and stick some of this information that we're sharing. And, uh, you know, if you have an opportunity, and it doesn't matter where, if you're in uh, smaller row crops uh, in eastern Canada, if you're in uh, large broad acre uh, agriculture in, in the prairie provinces, or if you get into horticulture uh, with berries or permanent crops with almonds, Go find a farmer and spend some time out in the field. That's that tangibility. You're going to find that the information sticks. You'll see it and feel it. It's just like playing with the Lego bricks. Um, and you can see what you need to do to change the conversation, to change that narrative, to start impacting different leadership models that others can learn. With the What the Duck leadership model as well, we can tackle real issues while exploring options. It's not either or. It's and but. We deal with the real issues that are present today. We talk about options to con that we need to explore uh, that are going to allow us to be sustainable. So we need to shift to regenerative agriculture, but we need to make it lawn lasting. So how do we make it sustainable? Um, and again, that, you know, one of the simple things is that direct to consumer model that uh, is very, very present. And I know some of the speakers in the next few weeks here uh, are going to touch on some elements that filter right into that, you know, from the finance to the AI, um, you know, the, ask the questions. How do we take some of those key components and plug it into this direct consumer uh, model that needs to be infected into our supply chain for, for food? Uh, and, and so the consumer can access product uh, that's going to be healthier and know where it comes from and work in this part of communities. Um, it also is going to spur on, and this is really, you know, uh, what I love about leadership is those leaders that, that take this theory, this methodology, uh, they apply it, they believe it, they live it, they're passionate about it, they start to become the new innovators. They think differently. Um, they, they take that equation of one plus one equals three and they move it to one plus one equals 10, one plus one equals 50. Um, whatever that number is, we need those innovative leaders to push us. And yes, it's going to feel awkward, but that's what leadership is about, that we go out ahead and we create some of that awkwardness and we learn from the mistakes, but we do it collectively. Uh, so with that, I want to, uh, thank you. That's, that sort of wraps up some of the end of my conversation here. Um, but I want to leave you with a great book and it's, it's actually a movie coming out. Um, uh, it's called Kiss the Ground. Um, and, and Josh is just a terrific, you know, if, if you want to read a great book, this is a book to grab. Um, another one would be Graham Sait and he's got a few different books on the market from Australia, but, uh, Kiss the Ground is a, you know, North American video. Uh, Matthew McConaughey is going to be voiceover for it. And it talks about regenerative culture and it talks about the leaders within. And it, uh, really is about how we can make this impactful change in our food system. Um, 
supporting the growers, supporting what we need to do to ensure we continue to feed our friends and family uh, and those around us in our communities. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for your time and for uh, taking time out of your day to join us on this uh, presentation and hear some of my thoughts and what fuels me uh, with passion. I, I'm certainly uh, happy to answer any questions you may uh, have put into the comment boxes uh, and continue um, discussing some of the key elements uh, that I've just just uh, shared with you. Thanks, Neil. Um, I think one of the things that people were most interested in knowing is what are, you know, you've talked about, you know, regenerative and, and sustainable. What are some of the other innovations that are occurring, um, you know, within agriculture? We talked about rooftop gardens, et cetera. What are some of the other sort of more innovative aspects about agriculture that we might not be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so technology has, is sort of a, a, a two-side coin uh, in, in terms of good and bad, but uh, the innovative technology that it's actually helping us get to a more regenerative state. So understanding our soil conditions, uh, the topography, all, all the different elements, and there's I think there's 16 different levels you can analyze soil at, and every level we need to understand what we need to do with it. So technology is allowing us to better understand that. Technology above the ground, um, where we we still, uh, let me back up a little bit. To move from conventional farming to regenerative, a full regenerative farm, we're gonna need what's called bridge products. We, we are unfortunately gonna need the fertilizers and we're gonna need some of that organic product um, to help ensure that we're stimulating the soil so we can still grow crops before it actually starts regenerating itself. And so those bridge products are very important. And one of the tech components of that is how do we use less of it, but still apply it. And so there's optical sensors that are scanning the ground 50,000 times a second uh, and putting nutrient down or, or foliar down. So we're feeding the, the emerging crop and we're, we're giving the plants, uh, the green leaves, um, food. And so the sensors are applying only what's needed to the plants. And so lettuce heads, uh, we're able to do that. Um, where farmers are following land still, and, and I don't recommend this, but, you know, again, it's not going to be an overnight shift. You know, they still fallow land, so they let it rest. Um, we may need to knock out some invading species so we can put in better uh, uh, cover crops in there that are going to actually take root. Um, and so again, we don't want to just broadcast spray chemical or herbicide across the field. We need technology to say we just need to pinpoint spot spray, put you know uh, a fraction of the amount down into our soils just so we can get the right cover crops onto our soil and be able to uh, you know stimulate uh, the, the biodiversity that needs to happen below the soil. So. Technology is really shifting that, and, and there's some great innovative companies out there. Um, data. The more we share data, the better we are. And, and again, this is get away from the what's in it for me, how do I, how do I um, have data that I can make money off of? Uh, I want open access data. You know, uh, in the States, it, just about everything is, is, is recorded uh, uh, from farmers, and it, it may be scary from a call it a safety aspect, but we need to better understand what farmers are doing in the soils. And so uh, in Canada, I really uh, advocate for more open, more open source data. And some of the tech companies that are out there, there's um, one that was actually born uh, from agronomists in, in Manitoba called Farmer's Edge. Um, and they talked about variable rate inputs, and they've got a lot of data within their system. And it's a, on a global basis now. How do we share that data? So growers can learn again that that supporting each other that that duck model. Uh, we need to use this data to help benefit what we're actually doing on the farms, and so the consumers better understand where the product is coming from. Another and thing that's happening is, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, bring up a good point in terms of data. If 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 we want to change, you have to bring everyone into the conversation on data and to share true trending mm -hmm. data, not just um, anecdotal. It has to have, you know, there has to be good scientific rigor behind it to show people the the evidence of why this is good other than it just looks nice. You nailed it. Absolutely. Yeah. It is um, it is a paradigm shift and, and data is going to help us get there. Um, we need to keep data simple. There's a great company in uh, um, uh, uh, the Rio Grande area in southern Texas and uh, they're actually putting stickers on all the produce that goes to the farmer's markets and they really 
sort of cotton on. They've got 50 farmers markets, and that, that that's from El Paso all the way down to you know Dell City. Um, and you don't need an app. You don't need to buy anything. You don't need to be subscribed to anything. You can just with any smart device scan your phone over this uh, label, and it will tell you who the grower is. You know how long they've been uh, uh, growing this crop, what was put into the soil, you know how nutrient dense, and, and that's the aggregation of data that's keeping it simple. So the consumer knows what what they're about to consume and, and how it's going to affect their health, uh, um, and you know potentially what that means uh, for the longevity of those crops in those areas. Um, we need to share that. We need to share those kind of innovative tech ideas. You know they're so simple to implement. We need to spread that. We need that groundswell to start to, to bubble over and, and share that. So technology, I think, is a, a key important aspect. Um, when it comes to indoor growing, and there's a lot of greenhouses and vertical and rooftop farming, uh, technology on in terms of the AI or the autonomous side is, is going to be very important. Um, we know with indoor growing, we increase the risk of pathogens, the human interaction not to lean into the pandemic that's happening, but you know how easy it is to transfer pathogens. And so the more we can use technology to help propagate, so you put the seed into the ground and it propagates and germinates and you get the little root that comes up. Um, we need technology just to tell us what's happening with that seed. And the only time we touch it is post-harvest. We can package and take it to our grower's market. Um, so technology will have a huge impact there where we can reduce and, and feel safer about the indoor growing conditions. Uh, those micro conditions that are happening. Outdoor growing is a little bit different. Um, blended crops, hardier crops. I'm not sure if you've heard of half cap berries. They're, you know, uh, they're sort of an oblong blueberry, but they're the highest antioxidant berry uh, in that sort of that blueberry sort of spectrum there is. Uh, and they're hardy. They grow in very harsh climates and they grow well. And so, you know, we need to be thinking about the species that we put and grow it. Uh, for the climates that we have and technology again and data will help us identify some of that. The the next thing would be a, a working together model. So uh, not the co-op model, but you know being able to leverage and support uh, each other and whether that is a grocery, whether that is uh, you know a supply chain, um, whether that is the grower, we need to be able to function together and identify what's working and what's not. So the consumer can access this product. Uh, and we also need to start uh, creating some better grants. Um, and, and they're happening. And I should say this is happening within our government structure uh, that other market spaces take advantage of. And we need to be able to put that back into agriculture so we can start to be uh, more innovative and, and test out new ideas. Great. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, it's been an interesting uh, time that we've spent with you and we appreciate your insight. So to everyone who's logged on, this has been recorded. It will be on our Tech Canada website. And uh, thanks again, Neil. And to everyone, hope you uh, think about your the food density in terms of nutrient-rich food and go to your farmer's market this weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you.